Welcome to the Blood Pressure Control Protocol Training. This call is being recorded. All phones will be on mute during the webinar. You'll be able to enter questions at any time during the event using the chat box. There will be time at the end of the presentation where our presenter will address your questions. At the conclusion of the event, you'll also be directed to take a survey that pops up in your browser. This provides us with essential feedback to help us improve these events. We thank you in advance for your input. And at this time, I'll pass the baton to HSAG Executive Director Padma Tagarse. Okay, thanks, Carmen. Welcome to the training offered by Health Services Advisory Group, the Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization for Arizona and California. We are hosting this webinar on blood pressure measuring and blood pressure protocol for healthcare teams comprising of care coordinators, community health workers, and medical assistants. When the medical team is trained in measuring blood pressure accurately, it demonstrates their ability to teach patients to perform accurate measurements on their own effectively. Although blood pressure is measured frequently, studies have shown good reason to doubt the accuracy of the readings. Errors in blood pressure measurements significantly increase cost and preventable deaths. University of Arizona senior lecturer Pam Peck will provide this training on blood pressure measurement and protocol. Ms. Pick is a registered nurse and full-time faculty at the, Arizona, at the University of Arizona College of Nursing, teaching for the master's entry to the professional of nursing program. Before becoming a nurse, Pam was the director of professional development for the Eller School of Management undergraduate program at the University of Arizona. Please welcome Pam Pick. Pam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Padma. Um, I'm excited to be here and thank you everyone for joining me today. I appreciate the invitation. So I have a few slides to go over and I um, understand that they will be available afterwards for you to download. Um, let me go ahead and scroll to the first slide. There we go. So we have some objectives to cover today on blood pressure protocol and blood pressure management. And the first thing we're gonna talk about really is just a review of what, you know, the basic of what blood pressure is. Um, then we'll move into some things about measuring blood pressure, recognizing abnormals in blood pressure measurements, and then kind of our action steps, what we do when we see those, those different numbers. Um, as always, if there are questions, you can put it in the chat. I know someone's moderating, and then we'll have time at the end as well. So the first thing um, I want to say is I am a registered nurse. I've taken a lot of blood pressures in my career, um, but I always want to say, you know, every patient is unique. So um, we always have to be mindful of when we talk about things and we talk in generalities that we also have to remember every patient is all of you know is unique and there are always differences. So we have to keep that in mind and obviously if we're ever concerned or we aren't sure what to do. We always refer to the provider um, to make the diagnosis and the decision on, on what to do. And also wherever you are, you follow your facilities protocol for whatever that might be. So I just wanted to start with that. So blood pressure, right, is I like to think of. Um, the heart, sometimes we tell our students this, kind of think of the heart in a very funny sense as a toilet. And um, it, it has, it's a tank, right? It has to have blood to, to pump. And if the tank is low, we have less pumping. And if the tank has too much water, we have a lot of pumping. So when we talk about our heart, we think we have the plumbing piece, which is blood pressure. And then we have an electrical piece, which is a whole nother topic. Um, when we talk about like heart attacks and your, your um, cardiac rhythm. So for blood pressure, right, we're talking about the force that's exerted against or measuring that force as the blood is pumped out of the heart and doing during a contraction. So you have that big push to the body of the blood. And so that's one measurement and that's kind of the resistance your, your body has to overcome. Then we have the other side where your heart is resting, right? And this happens very fast um, and it's refilling. And that's another measurement about is there any resistance there when your heart is at rest and refilling in that next cycle. Uh, blood pressure is measured, as many know, in millimeters of mercury, and we always record systolic over diastolic. That's how we measure it. So we will hear numbers 120 over 80, 130 over 100, 140 over 95, um, and that's always systolic over diastolic. So your systolic, again, is where 
you are pumping that blood to your body. And then the diastolic is when your heart is refilling and at rest, ready for that next cycle. So why is blood pressure important? Um, I think we can all come up with a lot of reasons, but it's really, you know, it's a complex process and it has a lot of factors that influence it. But the ultimate point is if you have good blood pressure control and the heart is pumping correctly and maintaining a what we consider normal blood pressure, you're perfusing your tissues. And that's kind of what it falls down to is we're feeding the tissues with that good blood that's pumping out and oxygenating the body all the way to the little capillaries and the toes and the fingers and everything else. So some things that do influence blood pressure, um, whether it's the force of the contraction, uh, the systolic, or, you know, again, the diastolic, um, some things that can affect your blood pressure are things like exercise, right? So if you take a blood pressure of someone who just exercised, it will likely be higher because more blood is pumping quicker. Um, pregnancy can affect blood pressure because women carry more blood volume and it's a different, you know, physiological impact on their body. Um, if people are dehydrated, if they are bleeding, if maybe they have had some sort of damage to their heart, that can affect blood pressure usually negatively. You might see lower blood pressures. Other things that it can affect blood pressure, as we know, um, what we'll hear the word peripheral vascular resistance. So, right, the blood pumps out to the body into all these arteries and then smaller vessels and eventually those little tiny capillaries. But as we age, as we have these different disease processes, um, the blood that those, the elasticity of those little vessels can change. So when we think about like high cholesterol, some of those um, arterial sclerosis type issues, um, some, some blockages in the vessels, some disease processes that might cause the vessels to get a little stiff, um, that can change blood pressure. That can maybe make it go up. Um, sometimes medications can change blood pressure or change how those vessels react. Um, and sometimes they can make them dilate medications or illness and make them so that the blood pressure goes down. But without worrying about kind of the which goes up, which goes down, it's really just important to know that blood pressure is affected by a lot of things. And at the end goal, as we push that blood out to the body, we're really thinking about, okay, how, what is that, you know, what is that um, resistance? And then how is it filling? But what might be some other factors that have changed this number over time? Um, because it's complex and, you know, the body will adjust for various things. So we have a quick poll. Um, if you have a cell phone available or um, are on, on something, you can just pull up on any web browser, um, pollev.com backslash pfic2020, and you'll be able to take this poll and we'll be able to see the results. It is anonymous, so we don't have anybody's information. So the accurate measure of blood pressure is important because, and you have four options. And if I could just jump in here, we've also logged the link to the poll in the chat. So just to make it easy for those who are on desktop as well. So far, I'm seeing a lot of choices for B. People another minute to get logged in, maybe. Got some other answers. Okay, so the correct answer is actually D, all of the above. So accurate measurement of blood pressure is important because one, you could likely see hypertensive patients throughout the day. We don't know, um, but we need to be able to measure accurately. Blood pressure is used, so that is correct. Blood pressure is used to diagnose and guide therapy. Um, even you know, as a bedside nurse, taking a patient's blood pressure, we usually took it every four hours unless indicated otherwise. It can really help you make some decisions in your nursing care and whether the patient might go home, um, what's going on after a procedure maybe, um, how they're doing, survive, you know, recovering from their illness. So it does really guide a lot of decisions that happen. 
Um, inaccurate blood pressure can lead to organ damage, like I said, if we're not getting accurate measurements, we're not really seeing what the blood pressure is doing, there could be issues at that perfusion piece as the blood's being pumped out to the body, and that can affect overall some organs, um, especially the heart, but others as well. And um, so all of the above is really the best answer for, for this question. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about more about measuring blood pressure. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of exactly how you measure blood pressure. I think most people have been trained um, in that to some degree, and there are different ways. Um, but you have some options when you measure blood pressure, right? You have the manual um, sphygmonometer. No one can say that word correctly. Um, or the electronic cuffs, which are typically most more popular these days. I do see the manual cuffs used when we really want to make sure we're getting an accurate blood pressure and maybe we're having trouble getting an accurate blood pressure. Um, but the electronic cuffs seem to be more widely available. Um, patients can even have their own electronic cuffs at home, which are good and bad. Um, I know someone who used to take their blood pressure at home and they would get a reading and they maybe if it was a little high, um, that would make them anxious and then they would take it again. And so then it would get higher and then they would take it again. And there was some education that needed to be done that that is maybe not effective. But on the other side, I know people who have cuffs at home and they take their blood pressure once every morning just to kind of see how things are going. And it helps because of the medications they're taking or, or their, you know, health history of what's going on. Um, but either way, you want to make sure the, the cuff, the actual part that goes around the arm is correct. Um, you want to make sure it fits correctly, um, that the machine is working, obviously. And the nice thing about the, the electronic ones is sometimes you can set them if you need to for frequent checks, depending on the, the patient situation. Um, but they do tend to work a little bit quicker. They're a little more uncomfortable, I feel like, for the patients. The manual tends to be a little tough if you have to blow it, pump it up a little bit higher. Um, but always remember, blood pressure actually changes almost minute to minute. So we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, but it's, you know, we start to look at patterns or, or the patient's kind of history because it can change depending on even the equipment you use and, and other things. So there are multiple ways to measure blood pressure, but these just, again, you have your manual and your electronic, and um, you just wanna make sure you're using them correctly. So some things to consider when you are taking blood pressure um, that can affect how the readings are done. Patients should always be sitting and they should have both feet flat on the floor. Don't let patients cross their legs. It's really common for people to sit down with cross their ankles, cross their legs. It's better to have your feet flat on the floor. Again, that cuff size is really important. So if it's too small, you're gonna get a really, really, really um, high reading or a higher reading. And if it's too large, you might get a lower reading. So you wanna try and have the correct like adult size. Typically, um, the cuff should be about 40% of the length of the upper arm. Again, there's multiple sizes of cuffs. You can kind of tell by putting one on someone. If it's going to wrap around a whole bunch, it's probably the wrong size. Um, but you want to make sure it's a good, a good fit. Um, have the patient sit still. No talking. That's a hard one because some people like to talk while they're doing their job and making you know conversation, but it's better for patients. They've actually done research to show talking does raise the blood pressure a little bit. And then again, we always sometimes have some things we have to watch out for. Some patients have maybe had breast cancer surgery. They've had... Um, lymph nodes removed in an arm, they've had uh, maybe a dialysis fistula placed, maybe a trauma to an arm, something, and they, or they might have a, a some type of um, access device, like a pick line or something for long-term use that they, that arm is off limits. And usually they'll know to say that, like not on my right arm, but always kind of just watch out, like, oh, is there something going on with this arm? Um, and again, also if it's like a paralyzed arm or something like that, use the alternate arm um, just to be safe. Um, also, Taking blood pressures over clothing also can affect your readings. And sometimes that's hard if people have on long sleeve shirts and such, but usually you can find a way to get to the skin and measure directly over the skin than over the clothing because it's better. Some things just to consider when you are taking blood pressure and looking at the readings. Um, men typically might have a little bit higher number. Uh, family history comes into account, right? So when we're thinking about patients, what's their family history? Their lifestyle, do they smoke, do they drink alcohol, have they just had caffeine? Caffeine really doesn't affect your blood pressure long term like smoking does, but it can change it in the interim or in the short period, short period. Exercise, like we talked about earlier, if they just ran from their car, or came from the gym, their blood pressure might be higher and then it'll go down. 
Again, position is, is important. So we have, you know, most people sitting feet flat on the floor. If you take a blood pressure standing, you're gonna get a different reading. Stress can affect blood pressure. I had a patient uh, a long time ago who his ex-wife would come to visit him and his blood pressure would always get higher when she came to visit. And it was just stress of, I think, that relationship and some things going on there. Pain can obviously increase blood pressure. We see that a lot with patients in pain. And then even certain medications, diseases, genetics, you know, that's why I always say it's not a one size fits all, but it's things to consider when you're looking at the numbers. And I think the important thing is, as we look at the numbers, again, try to remember, can we get from the patient, is this kind of where you run normally? Um, is this what we're seeing every time this patient comes in? Did, you know, again, were they stressed? Did they just run in from being late? And so they're, they're a little, you know, frazzled. They might need to calm down because these numbers can change. And we, we don't always just want to go off one number right away if we don't really know this person too well. All right, next slide. So here is what the American Heart Association is now recommending as far as blood pressure numbers and scales as far as where it escalates. So normal is a systolic less than 120 and a diastolic less than 80. You now have an elevated category. That is when we start to consistently range from 120 to 129 systolic, again, less than 80 diastolic. So this is where we have some consistent readings that it's getting higher and higher. People with this um, reading probably will develop some type of high blood pressure, hypertension down the road. But if they saw their doctor at that point and maybe had some conversations, did some lifestyle changes, it might mitigate it right there. Then we get into hypertension, which is what we consider high blood pressure. And now we have stage one and stage two. So systolic 130 to 139, the diastolic is now between 80 and 89. That's where, um, again, those consistent measures, it keeps happening. This is where sometimes medication is required and that's where the provider needs to decide um, that this patient might be at higher risk for some other things and, and needs some intervention. And then obviously 140 or higher for systolic and 90 or higher for diastolic, that is hypertension stage two. And that patient needs to, to see a physician or provider and decide what, you know, be, before lifestyle, besides lifestyle changes, there's also probably additional medications and other things that they need to investigate. Um, there is what's called a hypertensive crisis. This is an emergency. That's when your systolic's above 180 and your and or your diastolic's above 120, because um, that is a, an emergency and that can cause some really you know bad outcomes for patients, and so that's something where they need to to be seen urgently. Um, always again, if someone is experiencing you know the high blood pressure plus chest pain, shortness of breath, change in consciousness, difficulty speaking, all those warning signs. Um, we don't wait for their blood pressure to come down. Those are obviously cardiac emergencies and we call 911 for that. So why do we care about these numbers? Um, because the, when the blood pressure starts to creep up, it starts to affect the rest of the body. So um, blood pressure, high blood pressure can cause heart attacks. Um, the arteries start to become blocked. We start to not get blood flow to the heart as well because we're not pumping as efficiently, it's pumping differently, it's pumping in a different way now. So that can prevent blood flow to the heart muscle and the patients can have heart attacks. Uh, we talked a little bit already about that peripheral vascular resistance. So we can talk also about peripheral artery disease, things like the cholesterol, um, the plaque buildup, right? Those arteries get narrow again, then it can't perfuse that blood out when it pumps, it's not pumping as well because it's getting blocked. Um, and so the tissues aren't, or the organs aren't getting perfused as well. And then heart and kidney disease can happen from high blood pressure. The heart and the kidneys work very closely together. And so if there's high blood pressure, the kidneys might not be able to filter what they need to do, um, filtering the blood. And again, the heart isn't pumping as effectively to give the kidneys what they need. So you can develop some heart and kidney disease. And then obviously stroke. If you have high blood pressure, um, it can cause blood vessels up to the ox that supply oxygen to your brain to either block, get blocked or burst um, and have some really poor outcomes. So blood pressure, as it increases, it's not beneficial to the body because it's causing more stress to the entire body, really. And that's why it's important to watch it um, as we see patients as it increases and, and then over time. So what can we do? So 
you know, you see someone, you see a patient, see their blood pressure, you're like, and they're like, that's not normal for me, or, oh, that's right where I'm at. Um, if you're not sure or you're concerned, sit for a bit and take it again. Um, we've all heard of white coat syndrome. So sometimes patients get really stressed when they see uh, any clinician, anyone from a medical background um, that's doing anything medical. So they, they get anxiety. Like we talked about, the stress can make it go up. So sometimes you just establish that rapport, let them sit quietly, give them a minute or two, and then try again. Um, it is always okay to ask, what is your baseline blood pressure? Where do you run? Because patients might know, especially those ones that take it every day, they might know. If this patient has a long history at the clinic or something, then you'll be able to see trends and see where they always run. But if you're seeing that number move up into that hypertension stage one, hypertension stage two, it's always wise to notify the provider and have them start looking at what could be going on. And again, hypertensive crisis, those really scary numbers, that's immediate medical attention is needed. Um, but you know, you always you don't want to always jump to, oh my gosh, what is happening if you get a number that seems a little off? If it's really off, yes, I would react. But sometimes you gotta try one more time to take it again, um, just to make sure nothing else is going on. All right, one last question on our poll. So same thing, you can text or go to the, the link that they put in the chat. Um, normal blood pressure is a systolic reading of, and then you pick your choice, less than 120, less than 130 milligrams of mercury, more than 100, more than 140. Okay, so per the American Heart Association, normal blood pressure is now a systolic reading of less than 120 milligrams of mercury. So I can go slide there. So that is where normal is now less than 120 milligrams um, systolic and less than 80 diastolic. That is now what the normal is. When we hit that 120 to 129 range, we're in the elevated kind of, it's a warning. It's a, hmm, let's just pay attention to this. Um, and see what's going on. And that's per the American Heart Association. Those are my references for if anybody needs to use them. Um, that's all I have for you today. I appreciate you taking the time with me. Like I said, we always have to pay attention to our patients. Numbers can only tell us so much. Um, and so we always have to make sure we're really might be mindful of what our patients are telling us and, and what the story, you know, the whole story is. But blood pressure is important. It really can have an effect on a lot of things um, with patient care and their, you know, all their different medical issues. So we need to be careful taking it correctly as well as just being mindful of what we do about it. So thank you. And I'll open up for questions. We have uh, the first question already lined up. Someone asked, what about a pacemaker? That will affect the readings as well, right? So pacemakers don't typically affect blood pressure. Um, they really are designed to work on the patient's heart rate. So um, for example, some people have a pacemaker because they're in a weird rhythm. For example, they might have had atrial fibrillation or some other type of um, heart rhythm. And so they'll get a pacemaker and it might be set to that the patient's heart now cannot fall below 60 beats per minute. And then if it does, that pacemaker kicks in and does what it needs to do for them. So pacemakers don't typically affect blood pressure too much because they're really more that electrical piece, like I talked about with the plumbing piece and the electrical piece, they're really the electrical piece of the heart. Next question. Also when taking blood pressure, do we still keep the arm at arm level? Uh, you should keep the arm at heart level. All right, very well. And 
how do you measure orthostatic blood pressure? Great question. So orthostatic blood pressure is where we um, take a blood pressure and you can do it a couple different ways. Um, from bedside nursing, we will take the blood pressure of the patient lying and then we'll wait, have them sit up and dangle at the side of the bed and give them a minute and then we'll take it again. And then we'll have them stand up, take it immediately upon standing and see the difference in the measurements. Um, some orthostatic measurements, they don't do the lying part, they'll just do the sitting to standing part. And what that's looking for is some patients, you know, if you, and you, we've all had this happen. If you stand up too fast um, and you didn't give your body a chance to maybe catch up, you get dizzy or kind of lightheaded. Some patients just have that issue. It's called orthostatic hypotension, where as they stand up or move to the next position, their, their blood pressure drops a little. Um, and it could be for a variety of reasons. But so you want to take it in one position and then in the next position and um, check the, the difference in readings. Typically, if that systolic changes over 20 points, um, that's usually something to alert a provider to. Um, the diastolic usually has to change maybe 10 or so. Um, again, it's kind of patient specific, but when patients start to have some of those dizziness episodes or maybe they've had some falls, orthostatic blood pressures are usually something you'll want to consider. Next question. So when taking blood pressure on a patient with a pacemaker, is it okay to take the blood pressure on the same side? Yes. Yes, you can take a blood pressure on the same arm where or, or where the pacemaker is inserted because pacemakers is kind of usually in the right atrium um, or ventricle and you can take a blood pressure where the patient has a pacemaker. All right. Um, should blood pressure be recorded at every office visit? Um, my opinion, and it's purely my opinion, I would say yes. Again, follow your protocols, but I think it's important, especially if patients are coming in for some type of appointment related to their health history, their disease management, whatever it is. Again, you're getting that that pattern. You're getting that trend. So it's a quick, good reading. Like we said at the beginning, it can tell you a lot. All right. Could you share some tips for adopting a clinical practice guideline? Well, I think the first thing is just really to get the whole group on board um, to, to start with the why is this important um, and why do we need to do it? And then make small, you know, it's it's always small little things you got to do to to implement new things. Um, and it might be education first and then, you know, a, a checklist or something. Um, but as you roll out a clinical practice guideline, it really, one, it's showing what's the best evidence is why you're using it. And it's always what's best for the patients. So it's not something you can just say like, hey, today we're doing this. <laughs> um, there has to be some steps involved and some buy-in, so usually the education piece and then the why and how are we going to do this. And, and thinking about the workflow as well helps when you're adopting a new, a new guideline, but um, they're needed and they're, they're out there for us to use. At what blood pressure measurement should we ask the patient to schedule an appointment to see the clinician? How often should the patient be monitored for high blood pressure? Sure. Um, I think, you know, again, it's patient specific, but if you're seeing a patient who's been running in what now we're terming normal, less than 120 systolic, and suddenly now you're seeing in there, it's, it's getting elevated, um, that would probably be a sign to say, okay, maybe you should see the provider um, just to check, you know, what else could be going on. Um, if they're, you know, I mean, again, and we, we talk a lot about running high, but people can run low as well. So there's that side to it. Usually when people run low, it's because of illness or medications or something else. Um, so, sorry, tell me the second part of the question. How often? Sure. Is uh, how often should the patient be monitored for high blood pressure? That's up to them and their provider um, and kind of their situation. Depending if they're starting a new medication, they might be monitored more frequently because of the new medication. It, um, depending on how high they're running, or if they're having symptoms from the high blood pressure. So it's really patient specific and that's really up to the provider to decide how often. Um, so I don't, I can't give a specific number. Fair enough. Well, I think we've run out of questions uh, to our speaker, Pam Fick. Thank you for your insights. And as we close the webinar,
I'll ask everyone to take a few minutes to answer the survey that will automatically appear when the event closes. In addition, after the webinar closes, you're going to receive a thank you email. It'll contain the link where you can download the slides and where later today we'll post the recording of the webinar. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.